Uh, so, uh, you know, our last name's Allstrand, Marvin and Susan Allstrand, and uh, uh, we live uh, out by Ambrose Creek. We have grandkids in the area, that's for kind of why we're here. And uh, I've been, had the Lord has opened the doors for me for about 10, 11 years for doing pulpit supply. And we were at a smaller church in Idaho, actually, and one pastor, and uh, we were, I was on an elder on the board, and he had came to the board, and he said, well, you know, i got to be gone in a week or so. And, and I can't find anybody to fill the pulpit, so one of you three have to do it. Well, the other two didn't even raise their hand, so I kind of got, I, you know how that goes. Well, okay, well then, and I enjoyed it. The Lord has opened the door since then, and so being a part of Rocky Mountain, we've had the opportunity to, to go to a number of different churches. So that's kind of where we're from. I'm not a trained pastor. I did go through the Rocky Mountain Bible training for the last three years, but uh, just love the Lord, and He's always got a message that, he makes me learn first before I can share it. So uh, that's the best message to have. So before we start, I'd like to just pray right now. Just ask the Lord to be with us and with this word. Heavenly Father, we just glorify you today and let us, let the Holy Spirit guide us through the, in our hearts to be with us and let every word we said here to the Lord be in, in your power and your authority and from your word because we come here to share your word and to give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, I didn't want to stand on stage because I'd give you guys a little neck cramps. So I'm, so I'm tall enough already. So, uh, but the, the title of the message today is, is called The Lion. The Lion. And the scripture that we're going to read in a little bit is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to 19. So if you want to find out when we get to that, we'll, we'll read that. Well, I want to start off with a story. There's a story about a professor who was a professor at USC, Southern California, University of Southern California. And he was a professor of philosophy. And this professor was a devout atheist. And being a philosophy class, it, it was part of many majors. And so he would take this semester and, and basically trying to prove that God did not exist, that God could not exist. And for 20 years he taught this class, and at the end of the semester, every year he would say, because anyone who believes in God is a fool. And he would say, if God existed, and he would pick up a piece of chalk from the chalkboard, he says, if God existed, he could stop this piece of chalk from breaking when it hits the floor. And as he picked up this chalk, he said, this chalk says, it's a simple task, yet if God existed, he can't do it. So in his wisdom, he would take this chalk and he would hold it on and he would drop it on the tile floor and sure enough, it would shatter into pieces. And for all these years, there were probably students that were Christians in that class who were afraid to stand up. Because this fellow had a, he had a great mind, he was a debater, and it was hard to come up against this professor. Well, a number of years ago, there was a freshman that had to take this class. And the reputation of this professor preceded the students that came in there. It was a class of two or three hundred. And so the, the entire semester, this, this, the freshman prayed that, he would, that God would give him the, the power to stand up and the wisdom to stand up when the professor challenged someone to stand up. And he was afraid, like we all are sometimes. That time came when it says, if anyone in here who still believes in God is a fool, but if you do, then you stand up right now. And this young freshman in the back of the room stood up in silence. He was silent, I didn't know what to say. But the professor went on to his little spiel and says, you fool, if nothing I have told you all semester has proved that God cannot exist, and he could stop this, this piece of chalk from breaking when it hits the ground. As he picked up this piece of chalk, ready to drop it, it slipped out of his fingers and hit the cuff of his shirt, tumbled down his leg, the top of his shoe and rolled off and broke it. <laughs> Silence again in this room. He didn't know what to say. He just turned, last day of semester, and just walked out of the class. This young freshman who stood up who had fear, but he stood up. He went down to the front of the class. 
and to 200 or 300 students, he presented a simple <coughs> plan of the gospel. That God loved you. And there's salvation of sins in Jesus Christ. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 and 19. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So I'm going to ask you a question that's going to make you think. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds or so to come up with your answer. So you need to get a piece of paper and something to write with. I'm going to give you a question. And I'll tell you in advance, there is no right or wrong answer to this. It's whatever answer you come up with. And if you want to later on, I'll let you share. So uh, I'll give you just a few seconds to get something to write with. <coughs> Okay, so here's the question. In, describe in 10 words, not 9 out of them, describe in 10 words the gospel. Let's think about that. In 10 words, describe the gospel. That's about 30 seconds. I can't see the second hand on that call. So for me, I guess it's around 30. And you can add to this or take from this during the message. But just I wanted to make you, to narrow down your thoughts of what is the gospel in 10 words. I'll give you my answer later. But I want to ask a question. Is, is, as us believing Christians, what is our responsibility as we face the entire unbelieving world who thinks the gospel is foolishness, as Paul wrote 2,000 years ago? It hasn't changed. Should we dispute these views of the world by debating? We're using logic or using better speech or be louder than them? You know, I think there's three main reasons why we as Christians fail to share the gospel when we have the opportunity. When the Lord opens those doors, we use one of these three reasons why we don't share it. The first one is, what, is we're afraid of what they might think of us or say to us. Fear. Just like this freshman was afraid, but he prayed for strength. And the other reason we don't share is because we probably don't feel we have all the answers to the questions. <coughs> I don't have a memorized the four spiritual laws. I haven't memorized this, and I haven't memorized that. What if they ask me this? And we make it too complicated. We don't feel we're prepared. And the third reason we don't share is maybe we just don't think that that person would be interested in Maybe something is telling you that, you know, gosh, he's been witness to before and he didn't listen. So why should I bother? But I want to ask you the hardest question of all. If we're all Christians in here, believers, born again, someone shared the gospel with you. Someone prayed for you in your life. Whether you accepted Christ early or late. Think about if that person use any of those excuses in your life, where would you be? Think about that. So how do we present the gospel in a fallen world who thinks the gospel is foolishness? Well, there's three things we have to relate. remember about an unbeliever, and there's three things I want to tell you about God. The first thing about unbelievers is, as we all probably were at one point, is that Satan has blinded us. 2 Corinthians 4, 3-5. Satan has blinded the unbeliever. And that's what he's good at. That's what he does. 
The second reason is that we are blinded by our own self-righteousness. I don't need God. I don't need a Savior. I'm okay. I lived a good life. We're blinded by our own self-righteousness. But the third reason, we have third thing we have to know about unbelievers, and just like us, we are all, all of us are accountable to God. We are just as accountable as, as an unbeliever is. <coughs> Romans 1.20. Let's remember these three important things about God. God is even more burdened for the unsaved world than we are. 2 Peter 3.9 He doesn't want anyone to perish. He's waiting for all to come to redemption. Waiting for all of us to share the gospel to everyone who needs to hear it. The second thing about God is that he is reaching out to the unbelievers. Like some of the words in the song we had, he reaches out to those who are unsaved. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit convicts an unbeliever of their sin. If we will listen to him and let him. And then the last one, God has paid their debt. God has paid their debt in the name of Jesus. John 3.16. I want to just all of us say John 3.16, however you have it, have it memorized together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever shall lead to him shall not perish. That applies to every person. That applied to us before we were a believer. So I want to just, the clarity of this thing is that the gospel is very simple and very clear in how God has put it together. And that's how it has to be shared. How we have to share the gospel with someone else is very simply and very clearly. Because at one point we're all in the godliest man I ever knew in my life was a fellow named John W. Shear. And John passed away about a year and a half ago at the age of 101. He served the Lord for like 80 some years. This was Susan's father, my father in law. And I, I used to love just to sit down with him, chair to chair, and just, he had just so much wisdom. and. And we're at Susan's memorial for her mother uh, four or five years ago. And, and I was sitting with him and I had told him that, that we had found all of his sermon notes. And what happened is the family was moving them out of their house and into the rest home. And, and Susan called him and said, hey, Marvin, you want some of Dad's sermon notes? I said, sure. You know, I'm thinking a few. Well, so we go down a month or two later, pick them up, and there's, there's now listen to this. You know how old fold-out file box is? In these boxes, 22 file boxes of three and four page sermons, handwritten, both sides, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening. Think of all the Bible time, the wisdom, the knowledge that they have. And so I was sitting there sharing, I said, John, we had found your sermon notes, and, and uh, we were going to share them with the family. And when I said that, his eyes kind of got big. Whenever he mentioned the Lord, he would smile. Put a smile on his face. He kind of reached out and, and pulled me in to let me say, Mark. He says, when you share, when you talk to people, share from your heart what the Lord has done for you. And I think I remember that more than anything else because that's the gospel. That's our share, that's our story. We can share the gospel with what Christ has done in our life. And no one can dispute it, no one can argue with it. You don't have to know all the verses, the answer, just share what Christ has done in our life. Before I was a Christian, like many of you, I was traveling down that road to death as fast as I could go. And I didn't know it. I didn't know it. And I just wanted to run my own show. And I remember my junior year of high school, and I had grown up in a, in a home that attended church. We, I wouldn't call it a Christ Center home, but it was a home that we went to church. I went to church, church camp and Sunday school and learned all the songs and everything, but it wasn't real. And then my mother accepted Christ when I was a junior in high school. 
And I saw such a change in her. We had, there's four of us. We had three, I had three sisters and, and me. We were tough on mom and dad. You know, a lot of us have been. But I, remember, I just saw such a change come over her life on her inside as she would begin to witness to me. And she would just, she wouldn't say, Marvin, you got to sit down, you got to know this if you're going to die in your sins. I, you know, but she would say, hey, Marvin, and she'd bring me the Bible and she'd say, hey, Marvin, look, look what it says, Marvin, it says right here in, in Matthew 6.33. It said, if you are, if you seek God and his kingdom and his righteousness, then all these things that bother you will be added unto you. He'll take care of you. She'd plant a little words of wisdom, little words of the gospel. She'd come to me and she'd say, hey, Marvin, you know, um, I, was, I was praying about this and God answered this prayer. And, and uh, I said, yeah, Mom, that's okay, good, I love you. I can go about my day. And when I was in high school, my dad had... We didn't have three sisters. He had, I, we only had a two bedroom house, so he took the, the porch, six by eight porch, and he put two walls in the porch. That was my bedroom. And being the only guy, I thought, this is my domain, you know, this is mine. And, and I was kind of a neat freak back then, not now, not Susan, but with all my bed, had no wrinkles in my bed and everything, and no one could come into my room, you know, and, and in those days I would go out at night and come home and I'd get some speed. I'd turn my car off as I came in the driveway and got into the garage and no one knew I was coming home. And I'd come into my room and I'd say, I see someone was sitting on the bed. And I thought it was my sisters. I'd go get on them. But I realized that that was my mother. was my mother praying. Just asking God to bring Marvin home alive one more night. One more night. Yeah, for two years I continued to reject the Christ that she knew. I got into college, or actually just before college, the Lord answered in prayer one night, one day. And I was through the, I had an opportunity to have a job outside the family farm, pumping gas and washing windshields. Remember those days? They used to do it for you. And so I had a first job outside of the house, I had the opportunity to take it, and instead of taking it, in my wisdom, my friends called me up to go snow skiing. So I ditched the job. No show. Went to go snow skiing. Well, that day, I didn't know that God was going to change my life. The last one of the day, I was coming down. I borrowed skis, old wooden skis with cable bindings, and then all day long, the skis popped off and popped off. I'd get tight and tight. So the last one, I'd take a tumble, sliding down the hill, head first. <clears throat> Finally stopped. My right ski had come off, my left ski was laying across the hill this way, with the boot in it and my foot in the boot. I said, that's not right. And I was angry. God broke my leg, severely broke my leg. God stepped into my life to save me from killing myself. And what he did, I had a cast, I could see my big toe, a cast up to here, but it brought me home under the influence of God in my for 30 days, I was in bed, couldn't get out of bed. Two more months, I was re restricted to a recliner, slept in it, lived in this recliner. And I was a miserable dude. I was making my, li my life and everyone else around us miserable. So anyway, I got through that. I went back to college, and for two years, my mother kept praying for me and our, my sisters. And one night in college, I was in the fraternity thing, and I said, Mom, I got this thing going on. She calls me up. She wants me to... Come listen to this guy speak at the Selwyn Arena. Well, the Selwyn Arena is a big basketball venue. He seats 15, 20,000 people. And she says, I want you to come hear this guy speak. He wrote a book. I said, who, who is this guy? Well, I got a fraternity thing I'm doing. So she says, well, his name's Hal Lindsey. I said, well, Hal who? Well, he we wrote this book. You just need to be there. And I always respect and love my mom. So I said, okay, mom, I'll be there. But I had plans. See, I had plans to show up late, 
sneak in the back door, kind of sit right there, and, and I could leave. But then I wouldn't have to lie to my mom that I didn't show up. And so I get there, I park way out by an exit thing, and I'm going to get in there. And I'm, either I showed up later, they, they started early or whatever. But anyway, there's people still milling around. So I'm, I walk in, and there's the whole floor is filled with chairs. And all the way up, there's people filled up all the way to the ceiling. I'm kind of looking around, and I think I'll never see mom. So as I'm looking around, I'm like, right over here, about the third row from the ceiling, there's a lady waving at me. Why? Why? And I was caught. My plans I had didn't work because I was caught. It reminds me of the Proverbs 16.9. Write that down. Proverbs 16.9. A man's heart plans his way, but God directs his footsteps. God directs his footsteps. I sat there that night and I couldn't tell you what Hal said because I had tunnel vision. I just the Holy Spirit was talking to my heart because of all the little things my mother had laid in my heart. And that night driving home, we lived about 30 miles away, and I just the Holy Spirit has done it for four years. My mother prayed. And that night driving home, I just pulled my house up on the steering wheel. I was looking out over the stars as I was driving down. I met the living God. I said, God, I don't want to die in my sin. Don't let me die in my sins. At that moment, I met the thing of God. As we all have. So what is the gospel in ten words? Anyone want to share it? Anyone? Is someone who wrote something down? What is um, the I just took John 3.16 and cut it down to ten words. Okay, what is it? It says, God loved us and gave us son to save us. Yes. And anyone else? Truth. Truth? Truth. Okay. Anyone else? Understanding. I put down food is spiritual, glorious, wisdom, trust, mercy, forgiveness, and it's a way of life. Salvation and grace. All right. 100% right. Here's my answer. It's not mine because I heard it from someone. Christ died for our sins and rose from the grave. Amen. Christ died for our sins and rose from the grave. You take any one of those things out and you don't have the gospel. The gospel is clear and it's very simple. And you have to begin with God. Because that's how God begins. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. He wrote his own book. A loving, caring creator. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger. Steadfast love, patience, and eternal. Eternal from there to eternal to there. I am the great I am. Jesus Christ. The Son of God, the Lamb of God, the light of the world, our risen Savior, He lives. <coughs> Acts 4.12 And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Sin. Sin separates us from a holy God. We're born of sin. We're of sinful nature. We have sinful desires. We want to control our lives, and Satan has blinded us. So who are we, man? Who are we? We're flesh. We're here today and gone tomorrow. The older we get, the faster that moves. Psalms 144.4 Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. You ever watch a shadow? You can actually see a shadow move. Mm -hmm. Just how our lives go. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. <coughs> what is death? 
As I was traveling that road to death, I didn't know it. But we all didn't know that. Death is no heartbeat. No breathing, no brain empty. If there was a, a dead body here, and I had all the knowledge in the world, and all the technical equipment, and all the chemicals and drugs, and the greatest minds could, could man ever raise a dead body. Our Christ was risen. And he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He talks with me and talks with me a lot of last night. Remember those songs? This, you see? You know, no other religion in the world has a risen Savior than us. No one does. In Romans 10, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 10 to 11. Let me read this. Romans 8, 10 to 11. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit of life is because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, to his spirit who dwells in you. When I accepted Christ that night, the Holy Spirit came into my heart. And he's with me until the day he raises me, until Christ returns. That's the same spirit that rose Christ from the grave. But we have to take action because it's not just a Christ gospel for us. It's a Christ gospel that we need to share with our friends. We all have unsaved family and relatives. My mother prayed for me for four years. But we have to take action. And I want to tell you something. Charles Spurgeon said this. And this is the title of this message called The Lion. Listen to what he said. The word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend the lion. The lion will defend itself. You only have to let the lion loose. That's all we can do is share the, the lion the gospel. We can't convict people. We can't save people. My mother couldn't save me. She just shared God's word in my life and prayed for me. That's all that we can do for all our loved ones. We have to live a life as a witness for Christ. Let your light shine before men. Remember the little song, this little light of mine? Mm -hmm. Let your light shine me for men so that they may see your good works. Be a different person on the inside. That's what they all, the whole world wants that. You know, the gospel, the gospel itself should compel us to share the gospel. The power of God's word should compel us to share it. <coughs> you know, I shared my story with you for a couple main reasons. Number one, my mother prayed for me for four years and never quit. Never quit. Even when I was out and gone, she prayed for me. And those who we love who are unsaved, we have to continue because only God and the Holy Spirit can reach their hearts. The other thing that my mom did is she just planted little seeds of the gospel, I mean, words of God, just whatever she had to do. She just shared it with me. She didn't say, you've got to read this nine-page thesis of the doctrine of election. This will save you. Marvin, look what it says in John 3.16. Read that one. She handed the Bible and said, just read that. No pressure. That's, that was a seed that was planted in the life. And the seeds that you share, the gospel that you share with your friends and your family, the Holy Spirit is His. He's good at that. He takes those and He grows and ministers. It might take years. You may never see it, but it happens. The gospel is very simple and very clear. But yet, as it says in Corinthians 19, it's the power of God to those who are being saved. It's the power of God is what the gospel is. It's our responsibility to let the lion loose. That's our call to action. We need to be disciples of the Lord. Controlled by the Spirit of God. Sharing the Word of God to the glory of God.
that is what transform those around us. A little bit of the time, a little bit of time, y'all let the lion loose. Every day, the lion loose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for the simplicity and the power of the gospel. For your word has the power to save. But you have, you have given the responsibility to us as believers to share it. To bring forth the word to the unsaved world, Lord, in a simple and clear way. That God, you love them all. And you paid the price for them all. Let us just share that. And you've also given the Holy Spirit to, the, to everyone here. And the Holy Spirit will in, convict those who hear the word and eventually, Lord, come, come to salvation in Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.